In November 2010, American Masters aired a documentary called Lenin YC. It was later released as a DVD and is an award-winning presentation about John Lennon. A number of people were interviewed to share their thoughts about John. As many of you know, more than 90% of all material recorded for documentaries never make it to air. There is simply not enough time. I was interviewed for the broadcast and spoke for almost two hours with one of the producers. Knowing of the eternal curiosity and appreciation people have of John, I have probably done more than a hundred interviews, maybe two hundred, about my old friend. American Masters was kind enough to furnish me with some of the outtakes of our conversation, which I'm about to share with you in five parts. As is frequently the case, the person asking the questions is off camera and not wearing a microphone. So I'm just filling in his questions and some of my recollections as they unfolded in an organic and unedited manner. The entire piece begins after about five seconds of color bars. And know with me, um, uh, I go on a bit. It's okay. I'll and, and I want to save your editor uh, a, <laughs> a lot of trouble later on when he says, what you, why did it take 11 minutes for him to answer? Right. When did you meet you? Well, so whenever you had enough, don't feel as if you're being impertinent by saying, we got that, Elliot, and go to the, the next question. Well, I've heard that, let me just say this then. Let's not do questions. Let's just have a conversation about John and you. When you get bored with anything I say. Well, no, I think what I'll do is, like in any kind of nice table conversation. I haven't I'm scheduled anything till 5 o'clock in the morning. Fantastic. I'm an insomniac. The, tape, the guys are all set. Got a second bottle of Chardonnay in the fridge. So <laughs> just know yeah. when you've had enough of any individual category, it is okay for you to say, we got it, Elliot. I will not be offended. I'm no, happy. I'm devoid so, of ego attachment. To it. So, <coughs> you're, you're here... Are you a disc jockey? Are you a disc jockey at this point? That you, what kind of music is mattering to you? What kind of music are you playing? Give me some sense. Uh, uh, and we have New York City sounds like in the <laughs> background. Uh, uh, what, give me some sense of what you're, what you're interested in, and, and then how Yoko enters your work, or how you enter Yoko's work. I was born and raised in New York. Uh, and lived all my life in Washington Heights. When I was 17 years old, I got on a plane and I came out here to go to L.A. City College to learn how to become a broadcaster. Uh, three or four years later, I was on the radio. I remained on the radio for about 10 years on eight or nine different radio stations. Um, Playing the same kind of music every time? I started as a talk show host at, when I was 21 on a, um, a Pacifica station called KPFK. There's one in New York City called WBAI that Bob Fast used to host. And I would do these late night conversations with people who would call in. I was the youngest talk show host in America. I was 21 years old. And I did it for two years, five nights a week. Kids would call in, and I would start to play music that was representative of their times. It got a little bigger and got a little bigger, got a little bigger, until I find myself on a radio station, uh, you know, that had, was a big deal radio station. I had interviewed by that point uh, close to 2,000 people, including all of the uh, social icons of the time, uh, from the world of music and politics and poetry and philosophy and I mean it was a fairly comprehensive list of people. Um, and so you thought you'd interview Yoko too? Or? Well around 1970, 70-ish, I became really aware of the John and Yoko political statements. This was around the time of the Plastic Ono Band, uh, uprisings in Berkeley, the political havoc in America. Um, I became aware of their campaign for peace, and like so many of the people in my generation, 
they were speaking to me, you know? They were the only public figures, especially in music, that were speaking the word. I reached out to Yoko. Um, I had listened to an album she recorded called Approximately Infinite Universe, and I had never heard anything like it. So, although I had been playing on the radio, The Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and you know, all the obvious things, and I had been interviewing all the obvious uh, rock musicians, Yoko enters the picture and, uh, to my ears, creates a new audio landscape. And um, I found it enormously seductive. Now, why is that? Now, you know, at that moment, and she's written about it, she, you know, in, in the book recently she wrote uh, a little about Remembrance of John, and you have a piece in there too, she wrote a Remembrance called Two Cups, or Paper Cups, or something like that, where they're just, you know, there is a profound sense that she was at best an interloper, at worst a fraud, in the public's mind. There was an enormous amount of hostility directed at Yoko, unfairly. Undeniably, what what was it about Yoko where you you didn't? Or what is it about you, maybe? But what was it about Yoko that spoke to you differently? What was it? How how come you didn't see her as this kind of joke? Well, you know, that's I think the sort of unfortunate way that she was seen in the late sixties and early seventies. Uh, the first thing I did was uh, cast aside uh, the the unnecessary and meaningless gossip. Did I spend an afternoon of my life thinking about whether she was the woman who broke up the Beatles? Uh, did I consider the fact that she was older than John, or you know she had problems with some of the other members of the group? I wasn't. Uh, I mean, with all due respect, with all due respect to Beatles. Um, the Beatles are wonderful. Uh, they just did not resound in me to the degree that um, in, my, in my day it was Elvis, you know, he resounded. And from Elvis it was John Yoko. What was it about Yoko? Well, first I had to, uh, you know, I wasn't concerned about the accessory editorial stuff about her. I just put approximately infinite universe on my turntable, an old reco cut turntable, and uh, probably uh, engaged in some recreational activity prior to the actual listening, kicked back, and I heard somebody doing stuff that I simply never heard before. Um, and it took me on the kind of mind trip that jazz did at the time. And there was something about her that was rock and roll, but there was something about her that was jazz. There was something defiant. There was something vulnerable. There was something open. There was something different. There was something chaotic. But it was magical. It just, it just resonated in my heart. You know, it's like trying to... Uh, if I was talking to you right now about a classical musician, what it was like the first time I heard Brahms or Beethoven, I can't tell you what it was, but she touched a place within me where I felt I was at home. And so you reached out to her and you have a conversation with her, and does she disappoint? No. Um, I called uh, somebody at the uh, Dakota building. I don't know how I got a phone number, but I called somebody and I said, Hi, I'm Elliot, and uh, they never heard of me. I was a local L.A. disc jockey, you know, talk show host. Uh, may I do an interview with Yoko, and during the course of the interview, insert some of the songs from Approximately Infinite Universe? If memory serves, a few days later she called me and uh, said, uh, let's do it. And I said, when? And she says, when do you want? And I said, well, um, tomorrow or the next day, Sunday night. And I called her on the telephone. She was in New York, and that was our first interview, our first meeting, our first interaction. If I recall correctly, I interviewed her for an hour, an hour and a half, integrated it with the music, and aired it. Um, it was on either radio station KLOS or KABC, I can't recall. 
Uh, both of them are owned by the ABC network, now the Disney World. Yoko, you were educated at Sarah Lawrence School, weren't you? Yes, I was. Well, I don't know if you, you can call it an education. I was there, yes. <laughs> you, you almost answered the question. The question is, yeah. do you think that formal education, sitting yeah. in classrooms and reading from books, etc., etc., tends to drive people away from the, the natural pursuit of, of the things that you talk about? Yes, I definitely think so. You know, in my case, it was sort of like a, a constant struggle and fight between uh, my natural uh, inkling for uh, liking nature, you know, and things like that, that really overwhelms my life. And uh, with that and the library, you know, mm -hmm. I had to really put myself to really go to the library. And so I was, at one point, I was really sort of drugged by books, you know, mm -hmm. and I was always in the music library, always just reading or just listening to music. And library was like my cozy uh, little nest, you know. I see. There were times like that, too. Yoko, do you consider yourself a religious person? Uh, I don't know what religion is, really. I mean, if you consider Karl Marx is also a religion and all that, but I see them very objectively, you know. I can't really get into one religion, although I think it would be good if I could get into one religion and then probably I can make it. Make it means that I could really, if I had some faith, a really strong faith in something, then through that faith I can relax my body, I can relax into something, you know? But I don't have those things, really. I just believe naturally in people. Basically, I think people are all beautiful and uh, each, one, each one of them are like a vast universe, you know? So you I believe in people, if you call me humanist or something, then that's what I am probably, you know? So in essence, you don't believe that there's any greater force other than man and woman? Man and woman, flowers and, you know, trees, all the same, you know? But not anything like a divine being or a god or anything like that? Everything is divine, you know? I understand. Yes. Politically, Politically, you and John uh, uh, have gone through so many transitions together. Where is your head at today, politically? Well, uh, it's just, you know, basic uh, human, humanitarian kind of concept. It's very difficult. I know that the most difficult thing to do is to be what you are and not to join a party, you know? Right. Because it would be so much easier if we can say, well, uh, I believe in so-and-so party. Then it would simplify matters, you know. We can just sort of uh, set a rule to ourselves and just live as whatever the party tells us or whatever. But there's no party that we can think of in terms of, well, they can be our father figure or whatever, you know. I see. Uh, so we won't, I mean, I can say that I belong in any party or I trust in any party. Uh, we believe in our own bags, so to speak, you know. I understand. But we believe in our bags just as we have respect for other people's bags as well. What are the things in, in the world, Yoko, that disturb you the most, that upset you the most? The fact that people think that they have to be some way, you know, that they live in should, must, not that they are, you know? Overwhelming overwhelmingly positive from you know when you're on the air when you're a disc jockey a talk show host your nerve sense system or the telephone lines what do the phones say what do the phones say it's not important what the engineer said or the guy who runs the radio station the GM or the DJ who comes out before you or after you what do the phones say and the phones lit up and they were fascinated by what they heard and she talked not just about the music, but she talked about grapefruit. She talked about, you know, you have a conversation with Yoko. Uh, there's no such thing as it being confined to the appetizer. Uh, you might be in the appetizer while she's finishing the main course and has already digested dessert. And I was also listening at that time, if I may, to somebody who I felt was a genius. My definition of that word is somebody who didn't go to school, learn a whole lot of stuff, read a whole lot of books, and parrot the information back to me. I heard her make statements that I had never heard or read before. 
I saw originality in grapefruit and in her perceptions that I had never heard articulated. When she said to me uh, at a point in the interview that we should think globally but act locally and explain that before we're going to solve the problems of the planet, uh, we're going to have to solve what's going on in our own communities, in our own block, in our own home, in our own relationships with our own boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, lovers, etc. And before we do that, we've got to come to grips with what's going on within us. And before uh, we go through this on an intellectual level, we have to imagine, we have to dream, we have to believe. From our ver very first encounter, for me, she became the keeper of the wishing well. And when I got through with that first conversation, uh, I knew I had found somebody else uh, I connected with. But for the record, uh, I was born February 16th, she was born February 18th, for those of you who right. care about that. So then you understood why John, before John entered your life, you could see why John would walk. Not only did I understand what John must have immediately recognized, but I was bewildered by all those who didn't get it. Okay, so, uh, and I know that this was uh, genuine. Yeah. But there's a sense, uh, almost, that if, that it's a, it's a pretty good way to, to also get close to John, because he must feel uh, under assault, he must feel that the world, you know, I, I'm, one of the things I know that we talked a little bit, or Jessica talked about, is my sense that they came to the United States, like so many people did, as refugees. And I know that seems kind of nuts, that here's a John Lennon, who's a former Beatle, who's a huge, maybe the biggest star of music at that time. For him to be a refugee seems crazy, but I don't think that life was tenable for them in London. Uh, <clears throat> and New York, they were like, everybody else that comes off the boat in some way. Yep. <clears throat> Is that a, um, you think that's a crazy idea that, that, that they sought refuge in New York City? No. Uh, they were, um, <clears throat> they floated into the Ellis island of consciousness. Uh, and just as many came before them, escaping a kind of sense of claustrophobia, maybe politically, socially, religiously. With John and Yoko, in Europe it was impossible to move or breathe. And probably when they first saw the lady with the uh, torch and but wound it. I think it. it's even more specific than that. I think that they could not be in love in London. I think that it was the racism, the sexism, the sense that yeah. who is she to take our John? If you're talking just about John, he could be loved in London or anywhere in the world, but when the two of them merged as one, when he became John Ono Lennon, when it was clear that uh, you were buying into a package, uh, that would not be accepted in uh, Western Europe. You come to New York, hey, yo, where are you going? Get in the cab. How you doing? Beatles getting back together? Yoko, what's happening? It's New York. It is the land of the refugees. It is the land of people who have come from someplace else to New York to just be. Did John ever talk to you about his sense of New York at that point? Yeah, frequently. Frequently. And during the course of our conversations, I want you to know that any time that I tell you, well, John told me, I want you to know that if I use the expression, John told me, with the essential issues, I can back it up on tape in endless interviews that I've done <laughs> with John. It so, ain't Elliot's trip. You, th it, this so give is me John's sense of what New York was like. Was he fascinated by it? Was he, was he perplexed by it? What was John's... 
I mean, I've heard him say, you know, it's time, wrong, the time, this is wrong, and blah, blah, blah. But what was, there must have been a sense of... He said to me that it reminded him of early Liverpool, especially when he went down to the docks, you know, um, and uh, would sit at a bench near the Hudson River, and the two of them would walk along those areas. The water, by the way, just the water, plays an, in, an intriguing role in the John and Yoko experience. She is an ocean child, and uh, he was raised not far from the docks. New York, the island, the sensibility, made him feel at home. Yoko was part of the reconnaissance mission. You know, Yoko went out first in the New York experience. Did you know that Yoko was a waitress in Greenwich Village? when she was doing her avant-garde art shows um, and, and waiting tables. Which is uh, part of Fluxus, right? Which is part of Fluxus, yeah. which I can't explain. I just always wondered what it would have been like to have uh, gone into uh, the Café Finjan or the Café Wa or someplace um, around West 4th Street, sit down, order two espressos in a cold winter night, and Yoko Ono coming up and saying, hello, my name is Yoko, can I take your photo? <laughs> I still have a vision of that, and I've never seen a photograph of her, but it would be a, wonderful to, uh, to locate her customer and what kind of tips she received. Uh, she's never, uh, next time you see her, um, ask her about her experience in the restaurant. You know? ask her. <laughs> but Yoko obviously told John about New York and gave him some expectations. I think that if John flew from London with Yoko and landed in Miami or Washington DC or Philadelphia or Los Angeles or Las Vegas, he may have stayed a few days, taken some pictures and... Get New York going on in the background here. Call of the Wild. Exactly. Wait, wait a second for it to pass. It passes quickly. Yeah. If John had landed in any other alien city, Philadelphia, Washington, L.A., I don't think he would have stayed. What uh, was it about New York that kept him? The very simple things the things that, I'm a New Yorker, you know? I used to talk like that before I talked like this. You know, I went to broadcasting school so I wouldn't talk like this so I could get on the radio and talk. Right. When I go home and talk to my friends, as soon as I get in a cab, I start. So with John, he liked the way people talked. He liked the camaraderie among the people on the street. John, to the end, saw himself as a working class hero. He was more at home talking to the cab driver than the limo driver. He liked the way people dressed and moved around. Um, they didn't have to be in gowns or dressed uh, in trendy London clothing. Um, There's a sense in New York too that you know you don't bother the celebrity. You just, well, of you're course, too busy to give a shit. To be quite honest, the the big deal, of course, the big deal is that. The first time he walked down a street in New York City by himself, uh, there was a wonderful little coffee shop down the block from the Dakota that he would like to go to sometimes in the morning to read the papers and have a, a cup of coffee or espresso. They played opera music. Café La Fortuna. Café La Fortuna. And the distance from walking from the Dakota to there or in earlier days in the Bank Street area of Greenwich Village, walking to where he would get his coffee or pick up the papers or the magazines or do whatever he does. For the first time in his adult life, he didn't need three guys around him, didn't need to look over his shoulder. And it's New York, so what would people do? Sometimes they would just say, yo, John, thank you for the music. Uh, from time to time, they you're John Lennon. And he would say, uh, everybody says that. Keep walking. 
And from time to time, somebody would say, look, I don't want to hassle you, bother you, get this all the time, but would you mind just signing the thing? And we just sign the thing and walk on. But for the most part, it wasn't an event as it had been since he was 16 years old. He told me on tape that he was famous as a Beatle when he was 16 years old. The only thing that changed is that it got bigger. So from the time he was 16, he couldn't walk around Liverpool or Hamburg. Later, that meant the world, with the exception of New York City. Now, just for the record, John and I walked around New York City a lot. And I walked around New York and through Central Park with uh, John and Yoko a hundred times. And although it is true that New Yorkers don't bug John Lennon, it's not absolutely true. And if the fact be told, there are a lot of tourists who go to New York and see an ex-Beatle. Right. And there were occasions when we were in restaurants and before he was able to get the first spoon of soup to his mouth, somebody would come over and say, would you mind signing the napkin? It wasn't virgin territory, but it was just so much less till it reached a point where when he could walk into a store and buy a thing and leave and go home, and there were only two or three people who said, are the Beatles ever gonna get back together again? Where the cab driver would turn around and say, I don't know what they're trying to kick you out of the country, you know, those immigration people. Two or three for John was enough to feel that he landed in a new world, in a new consciousness, and he could relax his shoulders. He would be free. He would be free.